So now we've talked about philosophy. Um, we did our unit on metaphysics, logic, epistemology. Uh, we have a decent foundation and we have some terminology and concepts that we'll be using throughout the year, especially in the first semester. Um, so you can think of this lesson as, as a bridge between philosophy and theology because that bridge really is, is faith. Um, I like to say when we, do, when we do prayers at the beginning of class, you know, faith is reasonable. Um, and the reason I say that is because those three words really, uh, they really sum up apologetics. They sum up the entire discipline. Because no one's going to come to faith just because they're convinced of an argument. Um, the one who gives faith is God. But it really does help to have arguments ready, not only to bolster our own faith once we already have the gift, but also to help those who don't yet have the gift but who are open to it um, to be more well disposed to, to receive it. So um, I wrote this article a few years ago, and uh, this video basically consists of uh, just walking through the article, commenting occasionally on it, and uh, this will set the stage for the rest of this course. Since we are now embarking on a voyage of faith-seeking understanding, let's begin with a short prayer. And um, I put a footnote next to faith-seeking understanding because uh, St. Anselm was the one who, who came up with that phrase. Um, it's really synonymous uh, with faith is reasonable. It's really what it means. And here's the prayer that Anselm wrote. I do not endeavor, O Lord, to penetrate thy sublimity, for in no, in no wise do I compare my understanding with that. But I long to understand in some degree thy truth, which my heart believes and loves. For I do not seek to understand that I may believe, but I believe in order to understand. For this also I believe, that unless I believed, I should not understand. See, Anselm is saying here that faith comes first, understanding comes second, and uh, theology really is faith-seeking understanding. St. Anselm of Canterbury continued to develop the, the doctrine of his predecessor, Augustine, regarding a relationship between faith and reason. A man must have faith in order to understand. Credo ut intelligam. So that was uh, Augustine's Latin phrase for, I believe, in order to understand. Faith-seeking understanding, or fides querens intellectum, is the proper point of departure for any serious theological study. And that, those three Latin words, are, are, are um, attributed to Anselm, because they mean faith-seeking understanding. John Paul II commented in Fides et Ratio on Anselm's doctrine of faith and reason. St. Anselm underscores the fact that the intellect must seek that which it loves. The more it loves, the more it desires to know. Whoever lives for the truth is reaching for a form of knowledge which is fired more and more with love for what it knows, while having to admit that it has not yet attained what it desires. To see you was I made, and I have not yet, and I have yet to do that for which I was made. And in Latin, that is ad te vivendum factus sum, et non dum feci propter quod factus sum. Let's jump down really fast to those uh, footnotes in case you want to see them. Um, so as you can see, they're from uh, Anselm's Proslogion uh, and also from John Paul II's Fetus at Ratio. It's a really good encyclical. I recommend it, um, especially for this course in apologetics. So let's continue reading. Well, actually, just a quick comment on what John Paul II says there. I like to think of um, what he refers to here as a, as a virtuous cycle or a virtuous circle. But, you know, you've probably heard the term vicious cycle, vicious circle before where you do one thing and that causes a bad thing. That bad thing causes you to do the same thing that caused the bad consequence in the first place and so on and so on. But here we have the opposite. Um, and we have two, actually, two, two virtuous cycles. Um, the one John Paul II hints to here is the virtuous cycle of, of knowing and loving. You know, if 
Um, if you love someone, you're going to seek to know that person better. You can't say, uh, I don't know, let's say if it's a girlfriend or a wife or, you know, a boyfriend or a husband, um, just someone that you love, you're not going to reach a point where you say, oh, all right, you know everything there is to know about that person. That's it. No, of course not. Um, if you love someone, you seek to know that person better. But the more you know that person, the more you love them. And so they just build on each other. It's a virtuous cycle. Something very similar happens with faith and understanding. Um, because faith is a gift from God. It's a supernatural gift that we receive from him. Um, and it's, it's really interesting, too, because the very God that we believe in is the one who gives us faith in every second. In every second, he gives us that faith to believe in him. Um, faith is one of the theological virtues. It's received in baptism. But once you have that gift of faith, um, you, you can't just leave it alone. You know, uh, it can get stronger. It can also get weaker. You can even lose it. Um, but the way to keep it and to make it stronger is understanding. You see, that's what faith-seeking understanding means. If you believe, then you're going to try to find arguments that make sense out of what you believe. And when you find those arguments that make sense out of what you believe, you believe even more. Your faith gets even stronger. And so the two feed off of each other in a beautiful, virtuous cycle. This second virtuous cycle that I described is apologetics. That really is it. Faith is reasonable. Faith seeks understanding. When you have more understanding, your faith gets stronger. And, and, and not only is this good for you as a believer, but it's good for people who are non-believers that may ask you questions. So, um, continuing on the article. This is not to say that the non-believer can't understand the arguments for God's existence. What it does mean is that the non-believer must be a lover and seeker of truth, open to believing in God but simply not capable of it yet, in order for these arguments to make any sense to him. If the non-believer doesn't want to believe in God, that is, if he doesn't love and seek the truth, then no argument will convince him. And remember this when you get into arguments with non-believers. Um, you're, you're probably not going to win uh, for two reasons. The first is that they, they have to have a certain openness first. And if they're stubbornly insisting on their own position, there's really no argument that will convince them. Uh, and, and the second thing, too, is just natural human pride, right? Uh, how many people are humble enough in an argument to tell their opponent, oh, yeah, never, never thought about it that way. I've been wrong all this time. You're right. Yep, yep, you're right. It doesn't usually happen. But see, apologetics is still worthwhile, though, because it keeps us strong in our own faith. And even though your opponent might appear closed and appear not to be convinced at all by your arguments, perhaps you planted a seed. Perhaps they're going to rethink their position uh, in, in, in the privacy of their own thoughts. Uh, perhaps God will use something you say to help bring them to faith. Um, you never know. But, but the point in apologetics is it's, it's not winning arguments be, for the two reasons I already said. It's saying what you believe, showing people that you understand what you believe, and hoping that you'll plant a seed. Aquinas summarized the faith-reason relationship in the following way. God exceeds the capacity of reason, thus faith is necessary to supplement the truths of which reason is capable. And um, this is mainly because, you know, the faith has to be simple enough uh, so that uh, a first or a second grader can understand it, uh, right? Or, or, or someone simple of little education can understand it. Uh, the Catholic faith is not uh, it's not for only intellectuals or only pe uh, persons of a certain academic level. Well, of course not, because God wants all souls to be saved. And so, because God exceeds the capacity of reason, really for anyone, no matter how intelligent that person, but, but, but especially for people who, 
who, who who maybe don't have as much capability you know faith fills in the gaps augustine used to love to tell the story of his mother monica uh, saint monica one of the all-time greats um, wonderful example of, of prayer and perseverance um, monica was not an educated person but but when augustine had his conversion and and would sometimes chat with his mom about spiritual things uh, especially about certain verses from the Bible. He was amazed at his mother's understanding. And see, his mother got that understanding not from book learning and not from some kind of genius level intelligence that she had. I mean, she certainly wasn't a dumb person, but, but no, she was just a simple person who had great faith and most especially great hope and love in God. And so God then... Uh, was able to to supplement all the learning she was capable of uh, capable of to supplement that with with his own teaching and and and, and actually inspiring truths in her uh, that were that were beyond the capability of human reason. Number two, reason is subordinated to faith, and faith makes use of makes use of reason in three ways. A reason demonstrates the preambles of faith that is, the truths about God which are accessible without the assistance of revelation. God's existence, his essential attributes of unity, goodness, intelligence, etc. Um, most of the things we're going to be talking about in this first, uh, first quarter of, of this year-long course are preambles of faith. But, but don't think that you know even these preambles of faith are just uh, once you get the arguments, you, you, you've got it. No, no. No matter what, and, and Aquinas would agree with this, of course, faith is a gift. It's a supernatural gift, which reason demonstrates. You see, uh, here in 2a, uh, we're not saying that, oh, yeah, reason gives you faith, because once, once you uh, understand stuff about those preambles, you, you've got them, and, yep, you know God exists. No, it's not that at all. But reason demonstrates them once you've received that gift. And if you're watching this and you don't have the gift for whatever reason, well, you can pray for it. You can pray for it. You can say, Lord, I believe. Uh, help my unbelief. You can say that if you're um, just kind of on the fence, but, but already think you believe. And you know what? If you don't believe at all, or if you know friends who don't believe at all, but they're somewhat open to it, uh, they can pray uh, a more radically agnostic prayer, which is simply, uh, Lord, I don't know if you're out there, but if you are, please give me the gift of faith. All right, to be. Uh, reason helps us to understand in some ways the mystery is revelation by means of analogy and similitude. And um, this is really important for certain mysteries such as uh, the Trinity, you know, three persons and one God, or the hypostatic union, the fact that Jesus is uh, fully God and uh, fully human, uh, or the Eucharist, um, you know, transubstantiation, uh, the, the bread becomes human flesh, uh, the wine becomes human blood. Um, these, are, these are great mysteries. And although we maybe, well, we can't fully understand them in this life, and who knows if we'll fully, absolutely, with perfect clarity understand them in the next life, but either way, uh, reason does help us come up with analogies that at least give us some kind of understanding of great mysteries like those. And 2C, reason is helpful for apologetics, showing the rational validity of the truths of faith, and the rational inconsistency of denying these truths. Uh, and that's what this course is all about. In this course, we're all about um, showing how faith is reasonable, how it makes sense, but also showing how the other positions uh, that are against faith, those positions actually make less sense and are less reasonable. And number three, reason and faith can never contradict each other. Nulla tamen unquam interfidem et rationem vera dissensio esse potest. And that comes from the Vatican Council Number 1, Dogmatic Constitution on the Catholic Faith, Dei Filius. Right, that's why we scroll down the footnote there. All right, let's finish the, uh, the article. 
Although not all the truths of faith can be demonstrated by reason, many of the arguments against faith can be debunked by reason alone. This is precisely because faith and reason have the same root. Truth cannot contradict truth. All right, we can't say that something is true uh, in politics, but it's not true in religion. Something is true in the Bible, but it's not true in a science book. No, that's ridiculous because that would say that there is basically a double truth um, or that one truth can contradict another, but that defeats common sense. And since truth is truth and can't contradict itself, when we find, uh, when we find a disagreement or an apparent, apparent disagreement, for example, uh, between the Bible and science, and we're going to have a whole lesson dedicated to just that, we can't say, oh, uh, yeah, Bible is right, science is wrong. Science, or we, or we can't say science is right, Bible is wrong. Or uh, actually, both are right, but they contradict each other. No, that doesn't work either. Both are right. It's just that we may need to you know, adjust our interpretation of one or the other to make them consistent. But certainly, they can't contradict. Faith and reason cooperate with each other. Faith provides certain items of knowledge which lie beyond the scope of natural reason, though never contradictory to it. And reason gives logical arguments to support the tenets of faith. Both reason and faith are fundamental sources of truth, and one can't neglect the other without grave consequences. Reason without faith is rationalism. Faith without reason is fideism. And both are bad. Uh, they are two extremes that neglect the truth which lies in the middle. And we definitely want to avoid fideism. Because, you know, in fideism, you're just like, hey, I believe because that's what the church says. That's what God says. Good enough for me. I, I don't need any arguments. Well, that's kind of a cop-out, really. Um, it's kind of a cop-out. Because God wants us to use our minds to try to understand him and to try to understand the things of faith. That's part of getting to know him better. And the more we get to know him, the more we love him. So we're actually going to end up loving God more if we study these things. The five ways and other rational proofs, proofs for God's existence, that is, are designed to support and strengthen faith, not substitute it. However, they are very helpful for those who don't believe in God but would like to. Solid rational arguments can powerfully stimulate the hesitating would-be believer to ask for and embrace the gift of faith, which comes only from God. So I just want to reemphasize that point because it's so extremely important. Uh, to me as a believer, it's important because I like to be reminded that in every moment that I firmly believe in God, and it's true, I firmly believe in God. Um, in every moment that I exercise that faith, I know that that faith itself is coming from God. It's a supernatural gift, one that I first received in baptism. But I don't take the gift for granted uh, every day. I thank God for it. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of faith. Don't take that gift away, Lord. Make it only stronger. See, a believer needs to pray that way to, to, to grow in faith. A weak believer also has to pray. You know, the weak believer's prayer is uh, uh, what, what some of the apostles said in the Gospels. I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. In other words, I, I already believe, Lord, but there's things I'm shaking on, and please, I need help with those. And finally, there is the agnostics prayer. Lord, I don't know if you're out there, but if you are, please give me the gift of faith. All right, hopefully that uh, helps as a way to set the stage for this course in apologetics. Uh, and uh, the next lesson is going to be about proofs for the existence of God.